Section 5 of The Pearl Fountain and Other Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Lee. The Pearl Fountain and Other Fairy Tales by Bridget and Julia Cavanaugh. Redcap's Adventures in Fairyland. Redcap was the only child of a widow who lived by sifting the corn which the farmers brought to her. She threw away the bad seeds outside of her door, and they fell in the earth and grew there, so that after a time her little house was almost hidden in a grove of blue, red, white, and yellow flowers that smelt so sweet and were so pretty to look at that it was quite a pleasure to see them. Redcap liked the red flowers best, and he always stuck one or two in his cap, and that was how he came to be called Redcap. All these flowers bore so much seed that birds flocked to the place and built their nests near it. They sang all the day long in spring and chattered all the year round, and there was nothing Redcap liked so much as looking at the flowers and listening to the birds. He only wished he could know what they said when they talked to each other, and at length he asked the magpie, who was the greatest chatterer of all, and was always going from one bird to another with his head on one side, and ever such a knowing look. "'Dear me,' answered Magpie, "'I wonder you don't understand them, Magpie. It is as plain as A, B, C, and they are all talking to you. Go to the Queen,' they say. "'Go to the Queen, Redcap.' "'Do they?' said Redcap. "'Then, Magpie, I see what it is. I am to be a general.' I always liked red, and I must go to the queen and tell her so. Then I shall present you, said Magpie. The queen is a very intimate friend of mine, a good soul, a very good soul is the queen. Magpie, answered Redcap, you shall stay at home, if you please. What has a bird like you to do with queens and generals? Oh, ho, my fine fellow, cried Magpie. Do you think you can prevent me from going to see the queen? Mind my words, Radcap, I shall be at court as soon as you are. He flew away, and getting all the other birds around him, he told them how Redcap was going to court in order to become a general, and how he, Magpie, would present him to his friend the queen. Redcap got up very early the next morning to go to the palace, which was a long way off. He put three red flowers in his cap, out of compliment to the queen, and he stole so softly out of his mother's little house that he made sure Magpie could not see him. When he got to the palace and asked to speak to the queen, the porter at the gate inquired into his business. "'I want to become one of her majesty's generals,' answered Redcap. The porter laughed, and calling an usher, he told him what was Redcap's errand. The usher laughed, and went and told the queen that there was a little boy at the gate of the palace with three red flowers in his cap, who wanted to become one of her generals. The queen laughed, and said, Show him in. As Redcap entered the room where the queen sat on her throne, Magpie alighted on his shoulder, and perching there, said in his ear, Don't be afraid, Redcap. I shall talk to the queen. May it please your majesty he began. Let the boy talk, Magpie, said the queen. May it please your majesty, said Redcap. I always liked red, and I want to become one of your majesty's generals. I am very much obliged to you, answered the queen, and I am sure you will make a very great general indeed, but you must wait until a vacancy occurs. Goodbye, Redcap. With that, she nodded to him, and told the usher to show him out, and give him some lollipops. Redcap went home with Magpie on his shoulder, talking all the way. Well, Redcap, said he, I told you that I would present you to the queen, and you see all that has come of it. You are to become a general, and, in the meanwhile, you have got a lot of lollipops. Do you mean to say that you had anything to do with it? cried Redcap. Now, Redcap, said Magpie, 
You know she was looking at me all the time. She was looking at the red flowers in my cap, answered Redcap, and I don't think she would even saw you. You are very saucy, said Magpie, and very ungrateful. But never mind, I shall be kind to you for all that. With that, he flew away, and getting the other birds around him, he told them what fine things he had been doing for Redcap with the queen. Redcap thought to be appointed a general the next morning or so, but when a whole week passed, and he heard nothing about a vacancy, he could not help saying to Magpie, with whom he had made it up, The queen is not making a general of me. Are you sure it was go to the queen that the birds were saying? Of course it was, answered Magpie, and they are saying it still, but there are more queens than one, and between ourselves, I think they must have meant the queen of the fairies. I have never seen her, but I know, said Magpie, winking knowingly at Redcap, that she is dying to see me, and so I will present you as a matter of course, and show you the way to fairyland. Thank you, said Redcap, but I shall present myself to the queen, and as to the road, I know very well that fairyland lies beyond a mountain which grows close to my mother's house, and I shall get in somehow. Oh, ho! cried Magpie. You think you can do without me, do you? But I can fly, and you cannot, and I shall be in fairyland as soon as you are. Good night, Redcap. So there is a mountain which grows close to your mother's house, is there? Well, I never heard of mountains growing before. And Magpie laughed as he flew away. Early the next morning, long before daylight, Redcap got up and stole out of his mother's house, making sure that Magpie could not see him. But though he went round and round the mountain, not a cranny through which he might get in could Redcap find. At length, when it was day, he climbed up in a tree which grew high up in the mountainside, and when he got up on the very topmost bough, he saw Fairyland all below him. He also saw the queen, who was going out hunting, riding on a white horse, with all her gentlemen and ladies about her, and Redcap thought he had never seen such a fine sight. "'That's the queen,' said Magpie. Bless her majesty, how well she looks. Redcap looked up, and there was Magpie perched on his cap and flapping his wings at the queen of the fairies. Redcap tried to get him off, but he thereby loosened his hold of the tree, and down he tumbled straight into fairyland. There, said Magpie, when he got up. I told you I would show you the way to fairyland. This way, Redcap he added, strutting on before him. Shake the dust off you, my boy, and don't be afraid. I shall present you to the queen, and do all the talking. May it please your majesty, he began, going up to the queen of the fairies. Let the boy speak, magpie, said the queen. What do you want, Redcap? May it please your majesty, said Redcap. I always liked Red and I want to be one of your majesty's generals. Oh, by all means, answered the queen, but you must first change your cap. Give Redcap a cap, added the queen, addressing the fairy on her right, and take him to the stables, said she to the fairy on her left, and let him choose a horse to his liking. For before I make a general of you, Redcap, said the queen, you must follow the hunt with me. So one fairy gave Redcap a cap that fitted him beautifully, and the other took him to the royal stables, where Redcap chose a little black horse called Swift. The fairy warned him that Swift was rather dangerous, but Redcap answered that he liked a horse of spirit, and had him brought out at once. When he got into the saddle, Magpie perched on his shoulder, and said, quite loud, Don't be afraid, Redcap. If that little fairy horse should be vicious, I shall tell you how to manage him. Swift, on hearing this, was very much affronted, and snorted and tossed his head angrily. Let him feel your spurs, said Magpie. Redcap did as he was bid, 
and off went the little fairy horse with Redcap on his back, and Magpie on Redcap's shoulders. Swift went like the wind, and Redcap was rather afraid. But Magpie flapped his wings, and screamed with pleasure, and cried out, Faster, faster, I say. Keep up with the queen, Redcap. Don't let anyone get ahead of you. Let Swift feel your spurs, I say. Redcap spurred Swift, who went faster and faster, but who, instead of following the queen, galloped with all his might towards a large pond, and when he reached it, stood still. The pond was full of golden fishes, who all put up their heads and looked out of the water to see Swift, Redcap, and Magpie. Don't be afraid, Redcap said magpie i shall manage him come my fine fellow he added alighting on swift's head i shall let you see who is master clear that pond i say swift on hearing this kicked up his heels and flung magpie off his head and redcap off his back magpie flew away but redcap fell right into the water his cap got off his head and floated and Redcap jumped into it at once, for the cap, being a fairy cap, was as good as a boat. On seeing him in his cap, all the goldfishes burst out laughing and called out, Redcap, Redcap! Never mind, Redcap, said Magpie, who had perched on a tree. We shall pay these fairies out yet. When the goldfishes heard this, they set up a great cry and went and complained to the queen that magpie had threatened them. Did he? said the queen. Then turn him out. Magpie was accordingly turned out of fairyland at once. He went back to the other birds and told them that the queen of the fairies had consented to make Redcap one of her generals on his recommendation, and that she had appointed him her ambassador, and that he had so much to do that he should never get through it. Redcap was very glad to be rid of Magpie, and he asked the queen to let him mount Swift again and follow her. The queen said yes, and gave him a little whip. Just touch Swift with that, said she, and he will carry you safely, and now let us all be off again. So away went the queen, and all her ladies and gentlemen after her, and Redcap with the rest. But though Swift seemed to behave very well, he owed Redcap a grudge on account of Magpie, and as he ran, he asked all the fairies on his way to rid him of that nuisance on his back. They were willing enough, for they saw how much the queen was taken with him and his Redcap, and they were already jealous of him. Swift, who was full of tricks, pretended to be taking Redcap to the pond again, but Redcap said very sternly, not there, if you please, sir. Upon which Swift turned right round, and what should Redcap see before him, and between the queen and the hunt, but a field full of eggs, white as snow, and lying as thick as thick could be. Redcap reined in, for he did not know what to do. If he rode through the eggs, what a mess he would be in, and if he did not, how could he keep up with the queen? Swift, on seeing him puzzled, was so glad that he threw back his ears and laughed. Oh, ho, says Redcap, is that it? Then go on, sir, and eggs or no eggs, follow the hunt, I say. He gave him a touch of his whip. Swift stooped his head and dashed through the eggs, and in a moment every egg got a pair of wings and flew away, calling out, Redcap, Redcap. Well, Redcap, said the queen when he came up to her. How are you getting on? May it please your majesty, said he. All the fairies turn themselves into eggs to prevent me from keeping up with your majesty, and when I rode through them, they flew away and called me Redcap. Dear me, said the queen, I see you have got enemies. Take this sword, and when you are attacked, defend yourself with it. And now let us be off again. Away rode the queen, and Redcap after her. He did not spare Swift, but made him keep up with the queen, and Swift was more angry than ever, and told all the fairies on his way to rid him of Redcap. But Redcap was so brave that the fairies did not know what to do against him. 
They put their heads together, however, and presently Swift took Redcap through a field full of beautiful red flowers. Redcap was sadly tempted to get down and pick some, but he thought better of it, and only made Swift go faster. Then all at once a bee flew out of every flower until the air was thick with bees. Turn where he would, Redcap met nothing but bees. They buzzed so that he was almost deaf, and they shed such a yellow dust that he was almost blinded. Swift, seeing him so puzzled, threw back his ears and laughed. Oh, ho, said Redcap. These must be the enemies against whom the queen has warned me. He took out his sword and cut right and left around him, upon which all the bees kissed their hands to him and flew away, calling out, Redcap, Redcap. When Redcap got up to the queen, the hunt was over, and the queen asked him why he had not kept up with her. May it please your majesty, he answered. I was beset with fairies under the shape of bees, who buzzed at me and shed their dust upon me, and when I cut through them with the sword your majesty had given me, they flew away, calling out Redcap. Well, Redcap, said the queen, I see you have too many enemies to stay here. You must go home for seven years, and then come back to me. Swift shall take you to the borders of fairyland. Mind you, do not lose your cap, your whip, or your sword. Goodbye, Redcap. The queen gave him a nod, and rode away, and Swift took him at once to the borders of Fairyland. When they came within view of the tree from which Redcap had tumbled, there arose a great wind. "'Take care, Redcap,' cried Magpie, who was perched on the tree watching for him. "'You will lose your cap if you don't mind.' When Redcap looked up and saw Magpie flapping his wings at him, he was so enraged that he took out his sword and threatened him with it, but unluckily in taking out his sword he dropped his whip, and in stooping to pick up his whip with the point of his sword he let his cap fall off his head. He jumped down to get it back again, but no sooner did Swift feel him off his back than he snorted, kicked up his heels, and galloped away, carrying off the sword of which the hilt had caught in his bridle. Redcap ran after him, but there was no overtaking Swift, who only laughed and called out Redcap. So Redcap turned back to get at least the cap and whip, but they too were gone. The fairies came and took them away, said Magpie from the tree. I screamed at them, and I flapped my wings, but they took them all the same. If you had minded me, you would not have lost your cap. Well, well, better luck next time. And another time, too, do mind me, Redcap. With that, Magpie flew away and went and told all the birds how Redcap had come back from Fairyland without his cap, his sword, or his whip, and all that because he would not mind him. The first thing Redcap did when he got home was to get another cap, and the next to try and hunt away Magpie, but Magpie would not be driven away. He was fond of Redcap, he said, and would be kind to him all the same. So he came year after year, chattering with the birds, and telling them all the grand things he had done for Redcap. Although he had lost the cap, whip, and sword which the queen had given him, Redcap greatly wished to go back to Fairyland. He went to the mountain, and climbed up the tree, and looked down, but though he saw Fairyland very plainly, it seemed further away than the first time, and he did not dare to drop into it. Indeed, every time he went and looked at it, Fairyland got to be farther and farther, and at last it was so far that Redcap went no more, but was content to sift corn with his mother. He would have been quite happy with the flowers and the birds if it had not been for Magpie. When he grew up, he built himself a big house, and stayed almost always within it, in order to have nothing to do with Magpie, but it was no use. Magpie peeped in at him through the windows, and screamed and flapped his wings, and called out Redcap. So Redcap had to bear with Magpie after all, and after a time he did not mind it. 
End of section 5「Section 6 of the Pearl Fountain and Other Fairy Tales」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Pearl Fountain and Other Fairy Tales by Bridget and Julia Cavanaugh Fire and Water Fern had two brothers, Fire and Water. She was reared with Water and loved him dearly, for he was frolicsome, and leaped about her, and laughed and sang. And Fern, who was always in a sort of dream, sat in the shade and listened to him, and looked at him through her half-shut eyes, and thought him in his blue coat shot with green and trimmed with silver, the handsomest lad that had ever been. But Fire had been reared by his uncle, Sultan Sol, at the other end of the world, and Fern was grown up when she saw him first. She thought she must have fainted at his appearance, she was so frightened, for Fire had red hair to begin with, and the most angry-looking eyes. "'Oh, don't come near me, pray don't!' cried poor Fern. "'Or I shall die!' "'Wait, my dear,' said Fire, taking a pair of blue spectacles out of his pocket, and put him them on. My uncle Sultan Sol gave me these for fear of accidents. Yes, but don't come near me, still cried Fern, shrinking in horror. You wear a scarlet coat, and scarlet is a cover I never could bear. Fire did wear a scarlet coat lined with gold, and he thought it very fine, but he wished to please Fern, so he said again, Wait, my dear, my uncle Sultan Sol gave me a cloak that is the very thing. Just see. So saying, he took a brown cloak out of his pocket, for it was so soft and so fine that he could make it up ever so small, and spreading it out, he put it around him. That is my smoke cloak, he said. But to tell you the truth, I only put it on when I am out of temper. So pray do not ask me to wear it often. Well, now that it is on, you do not see my scarlet coat, do you? Oh, yes, yes, I do, replied Fern, shuddering. Pray get another cloak. This is too thin. Oh, I can make it as thick as I like, replied Fire. Only, the thicker it is, the more ill-tempered I feel. Never mind, said Fern, I cannot bear the sight of Scarlet. Fire frowned and looked quite angry, but he did thicken his cloak, and so it thickened and thickened till it looked almost black. Well, I suppose you will let me kiss you now, said he, going up to Fern. But she uttered a little cry. Kiss me, she said. Do you mean to scorch me up? Fire, who was always ill-tempered when he had his brown smoke cloak on, did not mind her a bit, and was going to take her up in his arms and kiss her, when water leaped on his back, he liked a practical joke, and clapped his arms around his neck. Now, water was always cool, and if there was a thing Fire hated, it was cold, besides people so rarely took liberties with him that he now got angry with his own brother. Let me go, will you? he cried, foaming and hissing with rage. Let me go, or I shall make you repent it. I am not afraid of you, old fellow, said Water, laughing, and giving him a sly kick in the ribs. You cannot do anything to me, you know. Fire tried to shake him off, but he could not. Then he thought to take off his spectacles and burn him up with his angry eyes. But Water had a little squirt ready for him, and Fire put his spectacles on again in a hurry. Then he attempted to pull off his cloak, but Water breathed upon it so that the cloak grew thicker and thicker, and Fire had scarcely breath left to cry out, I say, do you mean to smother me? This sobered Water, who let Fire go and declared he meant it all as fun. 
The brothers became friends again, but Fern would not let Fire come near her, and though she agreed to love him, she informed him that it must be at a distance. Well then, said Fire, I think I shall travel and see the world a bit. So will I, said Water. You will not mind my leaving you, Fern, will you? Oh, no, answered Fern, I shall not. To say the truth, she was rather pleased that both her brothers should go away for a while. She could not help being afraid of fire in her heart, and Water had become troublesome of late. He had such high spirits. The two brothers agreed to travel together, and Fern, still sitting in the shade, wished them a happy journey, and promised to wait for them there, and not marry till they came back. "'Suppose we get you a husband, Fern,' said Fire, who was good-natured and liked his sister. "'A fine, bright young fellow, ever so lively.' "'No, no,' said Water. "'Fern wants a cool, steady man, don't you, Fern?' "'You know nothing about it, either of you,' said Fern saucily. "'I want the wise man.' "'What makes you want him, Fern?' asked Water. "'Well, I want him because he is wise, and I am foolish,' replied Fern. "'Besides, I have heard that he lives in a wonderful place, "'and I have a fancy for a house of my own. "'It is very pleasant, no doubt, to live as I do. "'But I should like shelter in winter and shade in summer.' And when we have got the wise man, Fern, said Fire, are we to bring him to you, or to take you to him? I don't know, answered Fern, but I do know that I shall not stir. I have never walked one step, and I am not going to begin now, am I? I was born sitting, sitting I will live, and sitting I will die. Well, Fire and Water again bade Fern good-bye and went on their way. They promised Fern that they would look for the wise man, also that they would not quarrel, but the brothers had not walked half a mile when they began to disagree. It was all about the wise man, and where he was to be found. I know, said Fire, my uncle, Sultan Sol, has a brass palace on the top of a burning mountain, and I feel pretty sure the wise man lives there. Let us go to it, and take this path to the right. No, no, said Water. He lives in a clear glass house on a green island. I have seen the place again and again, and this road to the left will take us to it in no time. As if a wise man would live in a glass house, sneered Fire. Why not as well as in a brass palace on the top of a burning mountain? asked Water, getting angry. In short, the brothers had a quarrel, and only agreed in one thing, and that was to part company. Fire took the path to the right, and Water the road to the left, and each turned his back on the other. "'Don't get into trouble,' said Water, nodding over his shoulder at Fire as he walked away. "'You are a very mischievous fellow, you know, Fire.' Not half so mischievous as you, with your sly, quiet ways, answered Fire, blazing up. So don't you get into trouble, Brother Water. No fear of that, replied Water. I do good. And so do I, retorted Fire. And so they went on quarrelling, until they were out of sight and hearing. Well, they did get into trouble, both of them, for they were mischievous when they meddled. And this was the way of it. Fire walked on until towards night, and a very cold night it was, he came to an old tumble-down house just outside the town. For Fire likes town much better than country. This house belonged to a miser, who lived in it alone with his little grandchild. Fire pushed the door open, and walked into the kitchen. He found the miser sitting there at the grate, where two or three bits of coal were just going out, and his grandchild crouched in the corner, and crying with the cold. "'What is that child crying for?' asked Fire. "'Children are always crying,' answered the miser. "'That child cries because it is cold,' said Fire. 
How can I help its being cold? answered the miser. Make those coals burn, said Fire. I can't, said the miser. The bellows wants mending. But it was not true. He only wanted to spare the coals. I shall make them burn for you, said Fire. He opened his mouth, and there shot up such a blaze as you never did see, and Fire got into the blaze, and roared up the chimney, shouting hurrah! He got out to the top, and leapt about the roof, and presently the house, which was old, began to burn. Fire laughed to hear it crackle, and to see it shrivel up, and he never thought of the child. He only thought what rare fun this was. He soon found out, however, that fun gets people into mischief. The miser's house kindled the house next to it, and that lit another house, and so on. And though the miser's house was the only one that was burned down, all the people of the town agreed that Fire was a mischievous fellow, and turned him out, warning him never to show his face there again. For a long time after parting with his brother, Water met no one, and he felt rather dull, but at length, as he was walking by a little stream, he saw a bridegroom, who was going to fetch his bride. "'Good morning,' said Water. "'We are walking the same way, I believe. I shall be glad of your company, master.' "'I dare say you will, if you get it,' answered the bridegroom. "'But I want none of yours. I am going to fetch my bride.' oh then i must go with you said water i want to see the bride the bridegroom laughed and looked quite scornful see his bride indeed why surely remarked water a cat may look at the king as to that replied the bridegroom sneering we shall pass by here on our way home from church so if you will wait till we come back, you may look at the bride and welcome, but you shall not come with me. Water was very much affronted, but he did not pretend to be so, and merely saying he would wait, he sat down on a big stone nigh the little stream, whilst the bridegroom got into a boat and rowed himself across. At the end of an hour or so, there was a great sound of music, singing and laughing, and Water saw the bridal party on the other side of the stream. The bride was beautifully dressed, with a wreath of flowers on her head, and the bridegroom walked by her side as vain as a peacock. When he saw Water, he nodded and laughed. "'You may look at the bride now,' said he. "'Thank you,' answered Water. The bridegroom handed the bride into the boat, and she sat down, but just as he was going to get in and sit down by her, the stream swelled and swelled until it became a river, and the boat, with the bride in it, went sailing down and was soon out of reach. The bridegroom stamped and tore his hair. The bridesmaids screamed, and every one ran up and down, shouting, and still the bride and the boat went floating down till they came to a mill, and were stopped by the miller. The stream was so swollen, however, that the bridegroom had to go down ever so far before he could find a bridge and join his bride. He shook his fist at Water. He was in such a rage. But goodbye, said Water, and he went away laughing. Fire and Water had a good many other adventures of the same kind whilst they were looking for the wise man. They meant no harm, yet they always got into mischief, and the last trouble they had was the worst of all. It so happened that after going round the world, the two brothers came back to the very spot where they had parted, and that whilst fire entered the forest at one end, water got into it at the other. Fire had not walked long before he met a hare running for her life. "'What is the matter?' asked fire. The deer is hunting me, said the hare, and she was gone. Presently the deer came running by, and Fire asked him what was the matter. I am hunting the hare, answered the deer, and the fox is hunting me. After another while the fox went past. What is the matter? asked Fire. I am hunting the deer, said the fox, 
and the hounds and the huntsmen are hunting me and he too was gone then came the hounds and the huntsmen and when fire asked them what was the matter we are hunting the hare the deer and the fox said they then i shall hunt them with you said fire look and see what i can do with that he opened his mouth and breathed and he shook his hair and presently the branches of the trees began to kindle and after a while the forest was in a blaze now water after resting some time near an aqueduct which crossed the forest was going on again when he heard a great uproar he looked and saw the hare running and panting what ails you said he oh answered the hare the deer was hunting me when fire came and set all the forest in a blaze and now we shall all be burned to death then the deer came up with the tears running down his cheeks we must all die said he it is no use going away and he laid himself down then came the fox we shall be burned alive said he i do not care for the hounds now then the hounds and the huntsmen barking shouting all came on together and all gathered in one spot because there was no going any further through fire having hemmed them in oh ho said water you are at your tricks are you my lad wait a bit with that he got on the aqueduct and opened it everywhere till the river that was within came out and spread all over the forest and fire had to put his smoke cloak on as fast as he could but as the river spread and spread and got higher and higher the hare the deer and the fox the hounds and the huntsmen all cried out we shall be drowned you are worse than fire let us out let us out but water only said don't be afraid and he walked away he had not walked far before he met fire and said to him well old fellow you have been at your tricks again but i have settled you you have settled the hare the deer the fox and the hounds and the huntsmen answered fire and you ought to be ashamed of yourself upon that they had another quarrel and they only made it up when they heard a great hue and cry behind them they looked and saw the hare the deer the fox the hounds and the huntsmen all pursuing them for they had escaped somehow and they had agreed to hunt fire and water and kill them if they could fire and water now had to run for life and they ran till they were far out of the forest and they came to a cavern where they got in to hide at first they saw nothing it was so dark but after a while they were aware of a little man who sat on a stone with a big black dragon at his feet they were so frightened at the sight of the dragon that they wanted to run away but the little man called them back who are you he asked we are fire and water they answered and who are you i am the wise man fire and water were very glad to have found the wise man at last but they did not dare to go nearer to him on account of the dragon don't be afraid of him said the wise man i have only just finished him and he will not stir hand or foot he is the finest dragon that ever was but he is also the laziest i have coaxed him i have threatened him i have just given him a whipping and he will not stir i wanted him to take me about for i am tired of being here and as you see i harnessed him to a nice little car in which i was to sit but if he will not go what am i to do does he bite asked water bite i tell you he will not stir i shall make him stir said water yes said fire i think we can make your dragon gallop if we set about it water went and opened the dragon's back and got inside of the beast and shut himself up again then fire leapt on the dragon's neck and taking hold of his horns he urged him to go at first the dragon would not stir but looked blacker and more sulky than ever then when he felt water within him and fire on his back he got angry his big eyes glowed like two coals 
and he bubbled and hissed and spluttered till even the wise man kept at a distance from him but neither fire nor water were afraid water stayed within him and fire worked his horns till the dragon could bear it no longer and with the great snort and the smoke and steam coming out of his nostrils darted out of the cavern stop stop cried the wise man don't go without me he had only time to jump into his little car for once the dragon was off neither fire nor water could stop him when they were out scouring through the country as they flew along they met the hunt still in pursuit of the two brothers on seeing fire the huntsmen raised a great cry and urged their horses but fire gave the alarm to water and the two managed the dragon so well that the hare the deer the fox the hounds and the huntsmen were out of sight in no time fern was terribly frightened when she saw the black dragon and fire getting off his back and water coming out of his inside but when the wise man stepped out of his little car and praised her brothers for the clever way in which they had managed his big black dragon fern was better pleased still she could not agree to marry the wise man till he had promised to build her a beautiful palace all of glass which he did without loss of time when the palace was built the wise man put fern in it and took her away in his little car water got inside the dragon and fire on his back and off they went again and from that time forward fire and water agreed end of section six recording by phone Section 7 of The Pearl Fountain and Other Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Pearl Fountain and Other Fairy Tales by Bridget and Julia Cavanaugh. Tipsy's Silver Bell there was once upon a time a poor widow who had three little boys their names were dick jack and bill they were all born on the same day and were very much alike for they all had curly brown hair blue eyes and round rosy faces they lived with their mother in a poor little house which was the very last in all the town but which the widow kept so neat and clean that it was a pleasure to see it there were plenty of fairies in those days and they liked best such people as were tidy in their ways the widow knew this and did not let her boys forget it keep yourselves nice said she to dick jack and bill and the fairies will surely be kind to you the widow lived by sewing but though she rose early worked hard all day and went to bed late she found it so hard to make both ends meet that when her boys were only six years old she prenticed them all three dick to a tailor jack to a shoemaker and bill to a saddler the boys slept at home but went together every morning to their masters who lived in the same street and were next-door neighbors every one wondered at the widow for setting her boys to work whilst they were still so young and everybody laughed at her as well for as these wise people said who ever heard of prenticing boys of six but though they were very young the widow's boys were quick and before the first year of their apprenticeship was out dick had made a little coat about the size of my hand and jack and bill a pair of shoes and a saddle to match the widow was so pleased and so proud as well of this coat pair of shoes and saddle that she hung them up in her window so that every one who went by might see them many people stopped to look at them they were so pretty but every one agreed that the coat and the pair of shoes would fit none but fairies and that none save a fairy horse could ever wear that saddle even the masters of the boys grumbled so 
at these little things saying they were only nonsense that the widow took them down and hid them away out of sight the day that she put them by was a half holiday and the three brothers spent it at home they made a large kite and asked their mother if they might not go and let it fly in some fields just beyond their house she said they might provided they did not attempt to enter the forest that forest had a bad name in the town and these boys were afraid of it they promised not to go near it and went off to fly their kite at first it would not rise because there was no wind at all but presently there came a strong breeze and the kite went up up till all of a sudden the breeze became a gale which snapped the cord out of the hand of bill who held it away flew the kite and away ran the three brothers after it the kite however rose higher and higher until at length it entered the forest and before the boys had thought about it they were in it too oh dear said dick we had promised mother not to do it we did not mean it said jack yes said bill and since we are in and are sure to be scolded let us get the kite if we can so they followed the kite which went sailing along between the trees till it got caught in the topmost bough of an old oak that grew close to a large pool of water there was no getting at the kite there and the forest looked so dark and wild that the three brothers who felt afraid were thinking of going home at once when they heard the sound of a little bell in the distance it came nearer and nearer and presently they saw running towards them a little grey hound white as milk and who was the most beautiful creature they had ever set their eyes on he wore a gold collar round his neck and fastened to the collar was a silver bell which made the sweetest music in the world it tinkled as he ran and the day which had been so black and stormy became all bright with sunshine the whole forest was lit up and looked green and gold every bird began to sing and what was more wonderful all the creatures of the forest began to talk and the three brothers understood what they said is that tipsy going by asked the little squirrel who was perched on a bough cracking his nuts there the rabbit putting his head out of his warren replied it is tipsy don't you know him by his silver bell ha ha laughed the fox tipsy's silver bell is loose he will drop it presently dear me cried the magpie what will fairy prince do then he will not be able to get home to-night and the queen will be so angry and you know he can never find the bell himself never mind said the lizard dick jack and bill will tell him all about it as to that said the hare running by i could tell fairy prince but all of a sudden the silver bell ceased to tinkle the forest became dark again the birds left off singing and the creatures talking and all was just as it had been before presently tramp tramp and a handsome gentleman in green and gold came riding by he looked in a great hurry and was all but breathless boys said he have you seen my greyhound he is white as milk and he wears a gold collar with a silver bell to it he has just gone by answered dick he took that road said jack and his silver bell is under that hawthorn bush said bill who saw it shining in the grass the fairy prince stooped and picked up the silver bell the moment it tinkled the forest lit up again the birds sang and the creatures talked and the beautiful greyhound who had vanished came running back to his master who fastened the bell to his gold collar once more 
and now boys said he turning to the three brothers tell me what gift you would like to have and you shall get it for i am fairy prince and this is my dog tipsy i should like to make such a handsome little blue velvet coat that the like of it had never been seen said dick and i the most beautiful pair of little red boots said jack and i the prettiest little yellow saddle said bill they all spoke in a breath without taking time to think and when they had said their say all the creatures in the forest the squirrel the rabbit the fox the magpie the lizard and the hare burst out laughing and said oh you silly silly boys is that all you ask from fairy prince never mind boys said fairy prince very kindly it is a good wish and you shall have it but if you want me again come here take a pebble and just throw it into the water of that pool and now good-bye to you for the present he rode round the hawthorn bush with his dog tipsy the boys heard a little plash in the water and not a sign of fairy prince of his horse or his dog was left after that and the moment the bell ceased to tinkle the day became dark and the forest was as it had been before the three brothers who felt rather frightened got out of the forest as fast as they could and after agreeing not to tell their mother what had happened to them they went straight home the widow always sent her boys up to bed in the dark for fear of fire but when they went up that evening to the garret where they slept all in one bed they found a bright light burning in a little lantern and they saw on the bed a piece of blue velvet a red morocco skin and yellow leather with gold thread and lace and needles scissors and an awl and a last and everything in short which they needed to make a coat a pair of boots and a saddle they saw that fairy prince had not merely sent those things there but that he meant them to set to work at once and so they did and sat up all night and never left off till each had finished his task and dick had made the loveliest blue velvet coat all laced and embroidered and jack the most beautiful little red boots stitched with gold thread and bill the handsomest little yellow saddle that had ever been seen the brothers were so pleased with their work that they all three said we must show it to mother and tell her how we met fairy prince and tipsy in the forest but when they went down they found that the widow had gone to the well for water and as they were rather late they went off to work without waiting for her when the tailor saw the little blue velvet coat which dick had made he was both amazed and delighted the shoemaker went into raptures over jack's pair of little red boots and the saddler shook hands with bill said he was proud of him and that there had never been anything like the little yellow saddle indeed the tailor the shoemaker and the saddler thought so much of the work of their little prentices that without having said a word to one another they sent the coat the pair of boots and the saddle to the palace each making sure that the queen would buy them and that his fortune was made dear me what pretty little things said the queen i never did see anything so pretty but they are so little that i really can do nothing with them take them back to the tailor the shoemaker and the saddler and say that i don't want them when the little princess heard this she began to cry i want the little coat the little boots and the little saddle she said i want them for puss and my little wooden horse then my dear you shall have them said the queen she had only this one child who was a cripple and could neither walk nor sit up nor do anything but play with her cat all the day long 
the most famous doctors had not been able to cure her or do her any good and the queen who loved her beyond anything else in this world always let her have her way and gave her everything she asked for when the little princess heard that she was to have the coat the pair of boots and the saddle she left off crying and called her cat come here puss said she and put on that coat puss came the little princess put the coat upon him and at once he sat up as straight as an arrow puss hold out your left hind paw said the little princess puss held out his left hind paw and his little mistress put one of the red boots on him and it fitted beautifully and now let me have the other paw said the little princess puss held out his right hind paw and as soon as the boot was on he began to dance on the carpet so prettily that there never had been anything like it would you like a ride puss said the little princess fitting the yellow saddle on the back of her wooden horse who the moment it was on him began racing round the room when puss saw that he leaped up on his back and rode him and the two the cat and the wooden horse galloped round and round till the little princess clapped her hands she was so glad and the queen laughed so that the tears ran down her cheeks she was laughing still when an old lady who was also very wise came into the room ah what a pity said she when she saw what was going on if your majesty had only put that coat on the princess and these boots on her feet they would have fitted her and she would have been well at once as to the saddle the worst horse that ever was would have become the best in the world if he had only had it on his back and now they will never fit any one but the cat and the wooden horse i wish i had known that said the queen tell the tailor the shoemaker and the saddler to make me another coat pair of boots and saddle directly the coat and the boots will be for the princess and as to the saddle we will try what it will do for dobbin who has been worth nothing for ever so long the masters of the three boys were delighted when the orders came from the palace and they set their prentices to work at once dick jack and bill asked no better they made sure that what they had done once they could do again and they cut up the velvet and leather which their masters found them without a bit of fear but somehow or other the coat the boots and the saddle they made now were not at all like those they had made in the night and they were so slow about them too that the queen sent three times to know if she ever was to get these things the masters declared all three that the boys were lazy and sending word to the widow that she was not to be uneasy about her children they kept them and made them sit up all night the boys worked very hard indeed and at length the coat the pair of boots and the saddle were finished by the morning and taken to the queen by the tailor the shoemaker and the saddler but none of them would do the princess could not get her arm in the sleeve of the coat nor her feet in the boots and the saddle could never be strapped to dobbin's back take the trashy things away said the queen in a rage and let me have a coat a pair of boots and a saddle like the first or i shall make you repent it the three masters said never a word they were so frightened but each when he got home threatened his prentice to keep him on bread and water until he had done the queen's bidding the boys did their best but try as hard as they could they only spoiled cloth and leather upon this the masters put their heads together and after declaring that their prentices had never made the coat the boots and the saddle which had taken the queen's fancy they agreed to lock them up and not give them a bit to eat till they had confessed the truth and said who had made them now this took place in the tailor's house and dick who had overheard every word slipped out and went and told his brothers what shall we do said jack go to the forest and tell fairy prince said bill 
off to the forest they went but when they came to the pool they none of them wanted to throw the pebble in dick said he was sure his mother would not like it jack said he was afraid and bill said he would not at length they agreed that each should take up a pebble shut his eyes and throw it in at the same time with the other two so said so done each took up a pebble shut his eyes and threw the pebble in and the very moment the pebbles plashed into the water the boys heard the little silver bell they opened their eyes and there was the forest all lit up so beautifully the birds singing the creatures talking and tipsy going by and fairy prince riding after him well boys said he what do you want the three brothers told him their trouble and asked to make another coat and saddle and another pair of boots like the first on hearing this all the creatures in the forest burst out laughing and cried out in a breath oh you silly silly boys is that all you ask from fairy prince never mind boys said fairy prince kindly you shall have your wish and i dare say you will know better another time so saying he rode away with tipsy before him and the moment tipsy's silver bell left off tinkling the forest became dull and silent again the three brothers went home very well pleased for now said they we shall get out of trouble and so they did after a fashion they made such a coat such a pair of boots and such a saddle that the first were nothing to them and the best of it was that the moment the little princess put on the little coat she sat up and was as straight as straight could be and that as soon as the boots were on her legs she jumped down on the floor and began to dance so that all the courtiers declared there had never been anything like it the next thing she did was to ride dobbin whom the saddle fitted beautifully and who from a little vicious brute became the best and liveliest pony that had ever been seen the queen was delighted and wanted to make the tailor her prime minister the shoemaker her lord chancellor and the saddler commander-in-chief of all her armies but on second thoughts she resolved not to do so till they had made her another coat saddle and pair of boots for fear anything should happen to the first and now the troubles of dick jack and bill all began over again they had only asked for the gift of making once these things which the queen wanted and when they attempted them again they were just as unsuccessful as they had been before they did not wait however for their masters to starve or lock them up this time but went off to the forest at once in order to ask fairy prince to get them out of trouble again when they came to the pool they picked up three pebbles and threw them in without shutting their eyes for they were not frightened now but though the pebbles went in with a plash there was no tinkling of the silver bell no tipsy and no fairy prince riding by but instead of these a sound of voices coming nearer and nearer and calling them by their names i am sure that is my master's voice said dick let us throw stones in again said bill who also heard the saddler and jack who was sure that he heard the shoemaker put in his word said let us throw bigger stones this time so they picked up the largest stones they could find and threw them in with a great noise hoping that fairy prince would hear and come to them but no fairy prince appeared and instead of him they saw the tailor the shoemaker and the saddler coming up panting for they had run after their prentices all the way from town and being fat men they were very much out of breath when the three masters saw the boys they raised a shout of triumph and cried out to one another i see them here they are now we have them hurrah hurrah they rushed on striving who should be first take my hand said dick to jack take my hand said jack to bill the tailor the shoemaker and the saddler came on waving their caps and still crying hurrah and dick jack and bill jumped straight into the water and were seen no more the three masters stood and stared at each other 
then they called to the boys asking them to come out and promising not to starve or beat or ill-use them in any fashion but either dick jack or bill did not trust them or they could not get out of the pool as easily as they had got into it for they did not appear and after agreeing never to tell any one what had happened the tailor the shoemaker and the saddler went back to town very much crestfallen when the queen found they could not make her the things she wanted from them she said it was because they were stubborn and lazy and she sent them to prison to be kept there on bread and water till they should obey her as they were unable to do that they might have spent the rest of their days in jail if the queen had not died and the little princess let them out on the day of her coronation when the widow learned that her boys had run away and that no one knew what had become of them she was so unhappy that there is no telling of it she went about looking for them everywhere and asking all the people she met if they had seen dick jack or bill but no one could give her any tidings of them though she went to many strange countries and questioned all the wisest people in the world at length after wandering about several years she found a little wise old man who said to her go home and look for your boys within a mile of your own house though the widow was as tired as could be this comforted her greatly and she went home as fast as she could her way lay through the forest but as she was afraid of it she was going to walk round when she met a pretty little old woman who said to her better go through the forest if you want to see your boys again the widow's fear all vanished as she heard this she went into the forest at once and walked up and down the whole day long but not a soul did she see nor a sign of her boys did she find at length being fairly tired out she sat down by the side of the pool to rest a while before going home she had not been sitting there long when there came up a little boy with a rod and basket he took no notice of the widow but began to fish he was a very handsome boy and looking at him the widow was reminded of her own children and could not help crying what ails you said the little boy the widow told him how she had lost her boys and was seeking for them but could not find them nor learn where they were they are serving their apprenticeship in fairyland said the little boy when he had heard her out and they will never be able to get away out of it unless they find tipsy's silver bell on hearing this the widow cried more bitterly than ever and said now she knew that she should never see her boys again you can see them said the little boy if you will do what i tell you and what is that asked the widow you must take my hand and shut your eyes and not open them till i bid you then whomsoever or whatever you see you must not say one word the widow promised to do as he bade her the little boy took her hand she shut her eyes and plash they both went into the water but the widow was so frightened at this that she opened her eyes at once in a moment the little boy was gone and she was sitting alone by the side of the pool she stayed till nightfall hoping he would come back but he did not she went home at last but early the next day she was in the forest again seeking up and down for a token of her boys she found none and when she was so tired out that she could not walk a step further she sat down by the side of the pool to rest presently the pretty little boy came with his rod and basket and began to fish he took no notice of the widow and it was just as if he had never seen her before seeing this and also thinking of her boys the poor woman began to cry the little boy at first did not mind her but at length he asked what ailed her and when she told him he promised to let her see her boys provided she did not open her eyes till he bade her and did not utter a word good or bad 
the widow promised everything and this time she kept her word for though when he took her hand and jumped with her into the water she heard it plash over her head she never opened her eyes till the little boy said to her look now and mind what i told you the widow looked as he bade her and she found that she was standing outside a window and that she could see through the glass in the room within her three boys were sitting there together very busy working they were fresh and rosy but did not look a day older than when they left her dick was making a tiny coat of scarlet cloth laced with gold jack was finishing a little high-heeled shoe of white satin the other stood made on the table by him and bill was stitching a little buff saddle so very small that the widow wondered for what horse it could be meant presently a door opened and a little gentleman strutted in he went up to dick and seemed to be saying well sir is that coat ready upon which dick rose and tried the coat on him and the widow saw that it fitted beautifully then another door opened and a little lady with a long train came sweeping in she went up to jack and he showed her the shoe she sat down at once and he put the shoe on her foot and worked hard away at the other one then the little lady and the little gentleman got into conversation but he was looking at his coat in a glass all the time and the lady was peeping down at her foot but this was not all bill having finished his saddle got up and went out of the room he left the door open and his mother could see a little groom holding a little horse outside the horse though small was very beautiful he was cream coloured and had a flowing mane and a long tail but he was also a spirited thoroughbred horse and he tossed his head and pawed so that the groom could scarcely hold him when bill approached and tried to put the saddle on his back the horse reared and plunged so that the widow cried out take care bill no sooner were the words spoken than all vanished and she found herself once more sitting by the edge of the pool in the forest she waited a long time hoping the little boy would come again to take her back to fairyland to have another look at her children but he did not and though she came day after day to the forest and sat by the edge of the pool she never saw him again the three brothers often thought of their mother and wished to see her but they were very happy with the fairies who made ever so much of them they had been seven years in fairyland when fairy prince got married and there were great rejoicings in the palace there was a grand dinner to which dick jack and bill were invited and after dinner a grand ball which was one of the finest things that had ever been seen the boys could not dance with the fairies who were of the small species for fear of treading upon them they could only look on and after a while dick and jack got tired of it and went down to the garden to listen to the queen's talking bird but bill stayed in the ballroom to see the bridegroom valse with the bride for though very prince looked such a handsome gentleman when he was up in the world he was as little as the other fairies once he was below the talking bird perched on a tree at the end of the garden and tipsy watched every night at the foot of the tree lest any one should come and steal him dick and jack now saw the dog there in the moonlight but they also saw that he had dropped his silver bell and that it lay in the grass beside him that is tipsy's silver bell said dick to jack yes answered the talking bird on the tree and if you take and tinkle it you will find yourself in the place you came from and you need only tinkle it whenever you wish to come back again to fairyland when the boys heard this they took each other by the hand dick picked up the little silver bell and the moment it tinkled away they were out of fairyland in the forest by the edge of the pool though it was night they made their way to their mother's house and knocked at the door and when she heard their voices she got up and let them in and kissed them again and again and cried for joy 
indeed she would have been quite happy now if it were not that bill had remained in fairyland dick and jack offered to go and look for him but their mother was too much afraid of losing them again and taking away the little silver bell she hid it where they could not find it although dick and jack had been seven years away they were no bigger and looked no older than on the day when they ran away to the forest but each had learned his trade with the fairies and could work beautifully dick made the prettiest little clothes and jack the prettiest little boots and shoes in the world and though these things which they made were only fit for children yet they had this advantage that if the child who put them on were deformed or a cripple it became well at once their work was accordingly much sought after and fetched so high a price that they earned a great deal of money and made their mother very happy and comfortable there was only one drawback to all this they remained little boys with round faces rosy cheeks and curly hair whilst the boys whom they had known before they went to fairyland became young men and got married and had families of their own the people who wanted them were always just as civil as if they had been big men with scrubby beards but those who did not jeered at and laughed at them till they were half sick of their lives and wished themselves back again in fairyland their mother however was just as kind to them as ever and washed and combed and dressed them as if they had been little children still she never seemed to understand that they ought to be grown-up men she liked them as they were and had only one trouble that their brother bill had not come back with them give us the little silver bell mother said dick and let us all go off to fairyland and find him but the widow said she was too old to go to fairyland at her time of life but that they might do as they pleased when she was dead she lived for seven years after their coming back and at the end of that time she died dick and jack found the little silver bell round her neck and took it off when she was buried they shut up the house and went to the forest the moment they tinkled the bell they were off to fairyland and there they are to this day with their brother bill working for the fairies the people who had laughed at them for remaining little boys were very sorry when they were gone for no one ever made such pretty and useful little coats and shoes as theirs had been End of section seven. Section eight of the Pearl Fountain and Other Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cotty Hillman. The Pearl Fountain and other fairy tales by bridget and julia cavanagh chapter eight prince doran little prince doran was seven years with his nurse he was rocked seven years more and after that he slept seven years whilst he was being rocked his father the king gave him a little black puppy dog called trim and his mother the queen a little white kitten called muff trim and muff were very fond of doran and slept with him muff at his head and trim at his feet until he awoke and they awoke too prince doran was now twenty-one and as his father had died whilst he was sleeping his mother the queen said to him my dear it is now time that you should get married the princess sprightly is very beautiful and very rich you had better ask her to be your wife i shall send an ambassador to ask her in marriage from the king her father said doran and he did send the ambassador at once when prince doran was alone with muff and trim and told them what he had done muff said the princess lives a long way off she will be a long time coming why should we not go and see the world in the meantime muff said prince doran you are the wisest cat i know 
And he went, and he told his mother that he and Muff and Trim were going to travel, and that they would all be back by the time the princess arrived. My dear son, said the queen, you cannot leave your kingdom. You must stay and govern your subjects. Very well, answered Doran. I shall stay. That night, Prince Doran told Muff and Trim, who always slept with him, that he had agreed to remain at home in order to govern his subjects. They were both very angry, and Trim said, Why should not your cousin, the Duke, rule your kingdom whilst you are away? And as to your subjects, they got on without you whilst you were sleeping. Can't they get on without you whilst you are traveling? I declare, Trim, cried Prince Doran, you are a wonderful dog and quite as wise as Muff. When Doran told the queen that he must go and travel all the same, and that his cousin the duke would govern the kingdom in his stead, the queen, who was very wise, shook her head and said, My son, that will not do. Remember how long you have been sleeping, and how much time you have lost. Just so, answered Prince Doran. I have slept so long that I mean to be wide awake now, and I also mean to make up for the time I have lost by going about. All the queen could say could not keep Prince Doran. His mind was so bent on traveling. So off he set with Muff and Trim, and all he took with him was a quilt, which he strapped to his knapsack. When Muff was tired, Prince Doran carried him on his shoulder, and when Trim was tired, Prince Doran carried him in his arms, and when Prince Doran himself was tired, he rolled himself up in his quilt, with Muff at his head and Trim at his feet, and the three had a long nap. Prince Doran had been gone a long time, and he had already seen a great many wonderful things, when his mother, the queen, sent him a messenger, who came all breathless with haste to tell him that the princess Sprightly had arrived, and that she was the most beautiful princess that had ever been seen, and that she had brought with her forty chariots full of gold and precious stones, and that Prince Doran had better come back at once and marry her. You can't go home yet, said Muff, who was just then sitting on his shoulder, and who had heard every word the messenger had said. You know, you have not seen the great battle which is to take place between the cats and mice next month. How can you ever fight your enemies if you do not first see fighting? I'm glad you thought of that, Muff, said the prince. I must go back and see the battle, of course, before I go home. Tell the queen so, said he to the messenger, but that as soon as Muff Trim and I have seen a little fighting. I shall make haste home and shall marry the princess. The messenger went back to the queen, and Prince Doran went on. But he was not in time to see the battle between the cats and the mice, for it was just over when they arrived, and the cats, who had won the day, were burying their dead and eating their enemies. The prince, being too late for this, was thinking of going home in earnest when the queen sent him another messenger, telling him that the princess Sprightly had been so much affronted at his thinking more of seeing a battle fought between cats and mice than of coming back to marry her, that she had talked of going away at once with her forty chariots. Whereupon his cousin, the duke, in order to avoid a war with the king, her father, and also not to let all her valuables leave the kingdom, had married her. Well, that is settled, said Prince Doran. What shall we do now? Let us go and hear the wonderful bird who sings only once in a hundred years, said Trim. Yes, said Doran, we can go home after that. The wonderful bird lived a long way off, and when they came to the country in which she was to be found, it wanted a good bit yet to the hundred years. Since we have come so far, said Prince Doran, we shall wait till it is time for the wonderful bird to sing. The queen now sent another message to Doran. His subjects 
had got tired of waiting for him and they had all asked his cousin the duke who had consented to be king in prince dorian's stead so upon the whole the queen thought that dorian had better not come back what can't be cured must be endured said dorian at least we shall hear the wonderful bird but let us take a nap till the hundred years are out he rolled himself up in his quilt with muff at his head and trim at his feet and the three went to sleep under a tree in the forest they slept so soundly and they slept so long that when they woke up the wonderful bird who perched on the tallest oak in the forest had sung his song and would not sing now for another hundred years and now what shall we do asked doran i think answered muff and trim that we may just stay where we are then i must build a house said doran build it in the forest said trim i want to go hunting and leave plenty of room for the mice to run about said muff a house without mice is dull prince doran did as they advised him he built a house in the forest and muff and trim helped him when the house was built and all but roofed doran muff and trim felt tired and took a long nap let us roof the house now said doran when he woke no said trim let us hunt first yes i want an airing said muff well said prince doran i feel as if a walk would do me good they all went out in the forest trim ran first looking for game doran came after him and muff was on doran's shoulder they had not walked long before trim said i hear a great noise do you see anything muff i see two crows picking at something on the ground answered muff trim go and see what is the matter said doran trim went on barking till he came to the two crows they flew away and he found a little red squirrel all torn and bleeding which he picked up in his mouth and brought back to his master the little squirrel looked almost dead but prince doran took it home and laid it on the hearth and trim licked it and muff kept it warm after a while the little squirrel opened one eye then he opened the other eye then he moaned and stirred then he said thank you prince doran you have saved my life doran was accustomed to hear muff and trim talk but he had never heard a squirrel talk before besides this one knew his name and could not be a squirrel like any other he was much surprised and said at once who are you i am the fairy nap answered the squirrel and i am nurse to all the young fairies i lull them to sleep by setting in motion all the gold and silver acorns on the fairy oak i wanted to see the world but the queen of fairies would not allow it i teased her so much however that she consented to let me have my way but on condition that i should not be more than a week away and that i should remain under the shape of a squirrel all the time you see what has come of it i had scarcely begun to look about me when i was attacked by these two crows and they would have killed me if you had not sent trim to deliver me prince doran muff and trim were greatly pleased to have got a fairy they took every care of her and they would sit and listen by the hour to her accounts of fairyland at the end of three days the squirrel or rather fairy nap was quite well again for she had told doran to fetch her certain herbs from the forest and these had healed her wounds she was a little lame however for her left leg had been injured but otherwise she was very lively and ate the nuts which muff and trim brought her as heartily as if she had eaten nothing else her whole life she would not sleep with muff and trim however but when prince doran took off his coat at night and hung it up she got into his pocket and stayed there till the morning the first thing he did on getting up was to look for nap 
and take her out but on the morning of the fourth day she was not in his pocket as usual you need not look for me there prince doran said she i could not fit in your pocket now doran looked around and saw the most beautiful little lady he had ever seen and she was not merely beautiful but she shone so with gold and silver and pearls diamonds and precious stones that he was quite dazzled are you nap he asked yes said she i am the fairy nap and i must go back directly to fairyland and lull the little fairies to sleep and now tell me what gift you will have from me for having saved my life but please to make haste for i must be gone prince doran said he must consult muff and trim so the three put their heads together and whispered to each other then prince doran said well nap since you leave us free to choose and since you are going back to fairyland take us with you fairy nap was very much vexed when she heard this and she did all she could to make them change their gift into another she offered dorian to make him king again and muff to give him a charm which would make rats and mice run up to him and trim to take him to rabbit land but they all declared that they would go to fairyland and that they would have nothing else when nap saw they were determined she thought she would make use of this wish of theirs to see a little more of the world but this time under her own shape very well said she if i take you to fairyland you must lull the young fairies to sleep instead of me for a week and when you have been seven times seven days in fairyland you will find yourselves here back again prince doran muff and trim agreed to this for they did not know that a week in fairyland is exactly seven times seven days and not a minute less the moment they had said yes they found themselves with nap in fairyland under an oak tree all hung with gold and silver acorns all the young fairies were lying around the tree and each fairy was in a cradle of pearls and from every gold and silver acorn there was a thread and all the threads met at one end and were fastened together by a big diamond nap put the diamond into prince doran's hand and showed him how he was to put all the threads in motion and lull the young fairies to sleep with the music of the gold and silver acorns then bidding him on no account stop one second for if he did the young fairies would waken at once and the queen would be ever so angry she vanished prince doran did as he was bid he set all the gold and silver acorns in motion and lulled the young fairies to sleep but the music of the acorns was so sweet and delightful that he longed to sleep too so after a while he said muff take that ball in your mouth and let me have nod muff did as he was bid but after a while he got so sleepy that he said trim take that ball in your mouth and let me have a nod trim took the ball but got so sleepy he had to waken prince doran and when he got sleepy again he had to waken muff and so they spent all their time sleeping and waking and whilst fairy nap was going about the world enjoying herself they could not stir from under the fairy tree and never got a sight of fairyland at last prince doran got so tired that when he gave the ball to muff he said now muff manage as you like but whatever you do do not waken me very well said muff as prince doran rolled himself up in his quilt and went fast asleep when muff felt sleepy he gave the diamond ball to trim and said to him now trim manage as you like but whatever you do do not waken me with that muff went and laid himself down at the head of prince doran and was soon fast asleep 
Trim put the gold and eight silver acorns in motion, and lulled the young fairies to sleep as long as he could. But he got so sleepy himself that he could go on no longer. So he just dropped the diamond ball and curled himself round at the feet of Prince Doran. The moment the diamond ball touched the ground, the gold and silver acorns ceased going, and all the young fairies woke up and began to cry. Trim started up and picked up the nearest to him and shook it well. He was so frightened. Then Muff awoke and got another fairy and shook it too to keep it quiet. But as all the other fairies kept on crying louder and louder, Prince Doran awoke and, putting his hand in the cradle next to him, took the young fairy out of it and hushed it. And at that moment, the seven times seven days that they had been in fairyland being out, Prince Doran, Muff, and Trim found themselves at home again in the little house in the forest. Doran, with a young fairy in his hand, and Muff and Trim, with each a fairy in his mouth. Well, said Prince Doran, we have brought something out of fairyland. They were all three much pleased with their prize. The young fairies were very little, but very pretty. They required, however, so much care and nursing that Doran, Muff, and Trim had no time to spare to roof the house, for Doran made cradles for them, and they had to be rocked almost all day and all night. Then they could feed on nothing but dew and honey, and Doran had to go out every morning to get them the earliest dew, and Muff had to prowl about at night to steal the honey of the wild bees for them, whilst Trim stayed at home and watched them, and would not let the a soul come near the place. All the time the house remained unroofed, but on account of there being fairies in it, there was neither rain nor bad weather. It was always sunny in the daytime and warm at night. When the young fairies were old enough to go about, they were so frock frolicsome and so full of pretty tricks that Doran, Muff, and Trim never felt dull and grew fonder and fonder of them every day. Indeed, they could not let them out of their sight a moment, lest they should escape. Not that the young fairies seemed to wish to go, but Doran knew fairies are not to be trusted. Besides, he was afraid, lest the queen of fairies should steal them back again from him, Muff and Trim. One day, Doran's fairy said to him, Doran, you must open all the doors and all the windows of the house. Why so? asked Doran. Because we are going to make you, Muff, and Trim a quilt to lie on, and we want all the birds of the air and all the fishes of the sea and all the insects of the field to help us. When Muff and Trim saw Doran opening all the doors and windows of the house, they asked him what that was for. And when Doran told them, Trim said, Your old quilt would do very well. What do you want with a new one? And Muff said, I would not trust those fairies if I were you. But, for once, Doran would not take the advice of Muff and Trim. When all the doors and windows of the house were open, the first fairy called all the birds of the air and made each bird give her a feather. Then the second fairy called all the fishes of the sea and bade each fish give her a scale, or bring her a pearl from the sea. Then the third fairy called all the insects of the field, and made every one of those that spun webs give her some of their webs, and all those that were winged one of its wings. When they had all the feathers, scales, pearls, wings, and webs that they wanted, the young fairies began to make the quilt. They worked three days and three nights, and at length the quilt was finished. The groundwork was of feathers, the web to be soft and warm. The pattern was of fish's scales and insects' wings, and the border and the tassels were of pearls. And now, said the fairies to Doran, lie down and try, if you like, your quilt. 
Doran lay down, and the quilt was so soft and warm and pleasant that he rolled himself in it and fell asleep at once. And now, Muff, said the fairies, try how you like the quilt. Muff went and laid himself down at Doran's head and fell fast asleep. And now, said the fairies to Trim, do you try how you like it, Trim? Trim crept under the quilt till he got at Doran's feet, where he at once began to snore. When the three were fast asleep, the fairies went and sat on the quilt. Then it rose and rose till it flew away up in the air because there was no roof to the house, and Doran, Muff, and Trim, and the three fairies were in fairyland in no time, all under the oak tree with the gold and silver acorns, where Nap was lulling the young fairies to sleep in their cradles of pearls. When Doran, Muff, and Trim had had a long sleep, they awoke. Why, here we are, under the oak tree again, said Doran. Yes, said the three young fairies, and here we are with you, and it is it not a good quilt that we made for you? It is very good, answered Prince Doran, but I am tired of hearing gold and silver acorns. Besides, I must go home and roof my house. Have another sleep first, said the three fairies. Yes, said Muff and Trim. Let us take another nap. So they all three went to sleep again, and the three young fairies watched them by night and day, lest they should escape. And every time they awoke and wanted to go home, they persuaded them to have another sleep first. And that is how Doran, Muff, and Trim are still asleep in fairyland, and how the little house in the forest is unroofed to this day. End of section 8